In this video, we're going to go over calorimetry and heating curves. Calorimetry is the process of measuring the heat released or absorbed during a process. You can use a calorimeter to measure the amount of heat released or absorbed by a process. So for example, let's say that you have a biofuel and you want to determine what is the energy content of that biofuel. You can put that biofuel into a calorimeter and ignite the biofuel. As the biofuel burns, it will release energy which is captured by the calorimeter. The temperature of the calorimeter will increase in response to the heat absorbed. And depending on how high the temperature increases, that will tell you how much energy was released by burning the biofuel. Now, to understand how much heat is released, we need to be able to understand heating curves, which essentially is looking at how the temperature of a substance changes as heat is added. So in this case, we're going to consider a situation where we're starting off with a solid at a low temperature, like ice at negative 50 degrees Celsius. So at the beginning of the heating curve, when we were just starting to add heat, our ice at negative 50 degrees Celsius is increasing in temperature as the heat is added. So it goes from negative 50 to negative 40, negative 30, and its temperature increases until at some point it reaches this plateau. This plateau is interesting because during this plateau, as heat is added, temperature does not change. The reason why it doesn't change is because this plateau is at the melting point of the solid, which in this case would be zero degrees, the melting point of ice. And what happens when you reach the melting point is that the heat no longer increases the temperature of the substance because the heat is being used to break the intermolecular forces to convert the solid into a liquid. At some point, once the solid has been completely converted to liquid, then the temperature will start to rise again. So go from zero degrees Celsius and gradually increase until eventually you hit another plateau. This plateau would be at the boiling point of the liquid, which for water would be 100 degrees Celsius. And the boiling point here means that the heat added at this stage is being used to convert the liquid into a gas, again, to break intermolecular forces. And once all of the liquid has been converted to the gaseous state, then you have pure gas whose temperature will continue to rise with the increase of heat or addition of heat. Now, when you look at this graph, there's something very important to notice, which is when you add heat, the temperature either increases or there is a phase change. But you cannot have both processes happening simultaneously. So that's important to take note for the MCAT that heat can either increase the temperature or change phase, but not both. All right, again, when heat is added, it can either increase the temperature of your sample or it can change the phase, but it cannot do both simultaneously. All right, the next thing we can take note is that heat is required for both of these processes. That heat is required to increase the temperature. During these portions of the curve, when the temperature was increasing, heat was added in order to be able to increase the temperature. So we can make a note here, and that is heat is required to increase the temperature. And there are actually equations you're expected to know for the MCAT that allows you to calculate how much heat is required to increase the temperature. One of the equations is Q equals MC delta T. The other equation is capital C delta T. 
We'll explain what these variables are over here. So Q, of course, is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature. M is mass. And this makes sense because the greater the mass of your sample, the more heat you need to increase the temperature, just because there's more mass to heat. C is defined by as the specific heat and has a fairly long definition. It is the amount of heat required to increase the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. So again, specific heat, amount of heat required to increase the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Now, this is a very long and technical definition. So here's a simpler qualitative way to think of the specific heat. You can think of it as resistance to temperature change. So what I mean by this is, if you have a sample with a very high specific heat like water, that means a lot of energy, a lot of heat is required to raise the temperature. So it's very resistant to temperature change. Whereas if you have a compound like aluminum, which has a very low specific heat, then very little amounts of heat are required to raise the temperature. So it's not very resistant to temperature change. And of course, the last part of the equation is change in temperature. So of course, the amount of heat that you need to increase the temperature is going to be dependent by how much you want to increase the temperature. Now, we also have another form of the equation where instead of MC delta T, we have capital C delta T. The capital C essentially just encompasses both the mass and the specific heat and is defined as the heat capacity. The heat capacity is the amount of heat required to increase the temperature of your sample by one degree Celsius. So the heat capacity is actually very similar to the specific heat. You can also think of the heat capacity as the, as the resistance to temperature change. But the main difference between the specific heat and the heat capacity is that the heat capacity takes into account the mass, the quantity of substance. So this is resistance to temperature change, but takes into account the mass. So what I mean by this is, if you took one liter of water and 10 liters of water and you heated them with the same amount of heat, the one liter of water's temperature would go up higher than 10 liters of water. And not just because the 10 liters of water has a lot more mass, so it requires a lot more energy to heat up. So that would be indicating a difference in heat capacity between one liter of water versus 10 liters of water. Again. The difference is just mass because they're both water, so they both have the same specific heat. All right. The other important part of the heating curve is to recognize that heat was also required for the phase transition. So heat is required for changing phase. And here we have another equation we'll want to know which is Q equals N delta H. And here, within this equation, N is referring to the number of moles, which again makes sense because the more moles of compounds that you want to change the phase, the more heat is required. Delta H is the heat of fusion or the heat of vaporization. And the heat of fusion slash the heat of vaporization is essentially the amount of heat required for fusion or the amount of heat required for vaporization. Now, in some instances, the heat of fusion and heat of vaporization are reported as kilojoules per mole, 
but in other instances, they're reported as kilojoules per kilogram. But either way, it's just representing how much heat is required for that phase change. Now, the last thing I want to point out is, if you just look at this graph, you should take note that vaporization requires a lot more energy than fusion. You can see on this graph, a lot more heat for vaporization than for fusion.